solving the welding in the metal shop and uh, Arduino and uh, designing it all out in CAD and the bridge, which is our uh, design and tech lab. Um, and then people can take classes at a, in a formal level, either individually or in groups uh, or project-based classes here that are designed to help them facilitate their project or idea here at ADX. Um, and the kind of cool part about this to me is that is that people will come in, they'll take classes, and then maybe a year later at some point they'll end up teaching the very same class to the next round of members that are joining ADX. And out of all this, we've got our fabrication services building things like this crazy four-story tall chandelier. Um, and then we only have one fabrication person uh, full time. But then what we do is we'll have a you know we've identified the skills of hundreds and hundreds of people who are currently or previously working out of the space. We literally hire out of membership. So we this guy came to us with this crazy ass idea for a four-story tall like light and sound beaming motion sensing chandelier. Um, and he's a like genius programmer, the amazing designer. And so he came to ADX, and we worked with him using the skills around our building on uh, improving and solidifying the actual physical design, the process for building something like this. Because it turns out hanging, you know, uh, a bunch of heavy acrylic, uh, aluminum, and light parts off of strings that are that tall presents some safety and engineering challenges. Um, <laughs> And then we uh, we worked with him to prototype parts of it uh, on this uh, this this uh, experimental type of acrylic that literally no other company in town would even come near that job with a ten foot pole. Um, and then once we finally got it all working together and the light sort of beaming around properly through the acrylic, uh, we put out a call to our team and we were able to drop 20, 30 people on top of this project with a diverse set of skills virtually overnight. Um, and uh, the uh, cool people, uh, the, the cool thing about this is that all of these people were working together the whole time. So it's like people came in as members, took classes, taught each other classes, joined our fabrication team, often with just the skills that, that, that they had learned here, uh, and built this incredible project uh, that was designed by uh, a community member in Portland, um, and then was actually shipped across the country. So I think that's a very classic ADX story in that. Uh, we hadn't done anything like it before, but we we brought people together to work together and collaborate around the problem solving and, and accomplish this pretty damn incredible thing. Um, so I think you know, um, you know, starting to see some questions pop up in here that I can address. Uh, but I think that's a very uh, good example of localizing in terms of like there's a lot of design and build needs here. There's a lot of need for shared tooling here. Um, we uh, and then we've been adding a lot of like design, Autodesk, and uh, Arduino stuff here recently because we're seeing a lot of demand for that now. Um, and I see, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I'm probably totally massacring your name, Kavath uh, Um And will this makerspace be set up in the U.S. Portland? So. We are uh, a makerspace that's existed in Portland, Oregon um, for the last 2.5 years and we're advising people all over the world at this point about setting up things in their communities as well. Um, was that question directed at us or in general about the ones that, that have been talked about uh, being set up elsewhere? Yeah, because I mean we're here to share what we've learned in Portland. Like Mike said, we've been going almost three years and um, Princess Aaliyah approached us because she's interested um, in starting makerspaces all over the world um, d that are kind of directly related to and serving the uh, wildlife, wildlife conservation UAV challenge. So um, she, I think she really saw what we were doing here as a way to complement her vision for addressing problems around the world and actually having physical spaces filled with all of these resources um, to help people along the way. So giving a, that, that space where people can come together. Um, and so that it really, it really is about local communities around the world um, kind of assessing you know, what they need, what their community needs. Um, are they trying to create jobs? Are they trying to address uh, challenges like these wildlife challenges? Um, are there other are there other issues? Um, are they just wanting to have a place to come together and meet and share ideas? 
Um, all of those questions will determine how much space you need, how how and what how much space you need, what tools you need, um, what kind of programming you'd want to put on top of that um, space, and then therefore how much money it's going to take and how many staff you're going to need to have on board. So it really is, um, you know, we, we really we, we really want to help people um, assess, uh, you know, in uh, planning terms, which is kind of my background, we call it asset mapping, Look at, looking at what already exists in your community. Who's already doing bits and pieces of this? And, you know, the temptation is to just try to uh, plow forward and uh, recreate the wheel. And we actually get people from around Portland saying that they want to create an ADX, and we keep saying, we already exist. We're here. So come join us and help us be part of the movement to um, take this to other places around our region, around the state, around the, our country, and then around the world. So um, so it's really easy to want to try to recreate the wheel, but um, we've learned so much, and that's why we wanted to do these webinars is so that we could share that with you and, and help you more with the process of you know, step by step, how you get one of these off the ground, so you can build a really strong foundation and um, have the space uh, in whatever form it is. Um, you know, really be a resource uh, for for the community. Um, Kelly, okay. thank you so much. I do want to add for the people that asked about this. One of the things that we're doing for the Wildlife Conservation UAV Challenge is we're actually going to be setting up a makerspace in Port Elizabeth for the final competition. So then that way, as the teams travel for the finals to Amakawa, one of the things that could possibly happen is electrical problems, something can break. And that's when you'll actually really be able to appreciate the value of what makerspaces bring. And our goal is to leave that with Port Elizabeth as a community property. So anytime we have any, ch any challenge that we do anywhere around the world, our goal would be to set up a makerspace for that particular competition. But as we leave that location, it becomes a community property. And Gert that was on um, earlier, he is actually taking the initiative to set up a makerspace in Port Elizabeth. So we will be working with Gert but from the teams, if there's anybody that's interested in setting something up in your own communities, please, you know, feel free to shoot me an email and then we can work together and I'll talk to Mike and Kelly about it and see how um, we can help you get started in the location that you're in. So these are locations all over the world that we'd like to do. And what I'd like to do through the challenge is make it a network where anybody that sets up can tap into our network and find help anywhere else in the world through that channel. So our goal is ultimately to bring network of makerspaces all over the world together to be solving their own um, community problems, but also working together on these great opportunities of solving international problems. Wildlife is one, but there's several other problems that big corporations and companies can't do. And that's one of the reasons why I focused on starting the challenge with the Wildlife Conservation UAV Challenge was because there are no um, anti-poaching drones that were made for specifically for counter-poaching. So sorry, I just wanted to bring that in real quick. Um, all yours. Great. So uh, we're getting some reports of uh, some static and feedback. So uh, any of the presenters, if you're not on mute, um, can you try and be? And then I'm going to tilt this guy just so our sound isn't also beaming into the microphone. And I'm going to uh, work together with Kelly to put her gloves underneath the computer <laughs> to hopefully uh, reduce any static. Is that, uh, is that getting any better? Yeah, a little better. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So Tom from Makerversity in London. Hey, Tom. Hey, Tom. I've been listening on the phone, but down on your computer. Cool. Hopefully, let us know if it's not getting better. So Tom, uh, do you want to? Before we jump in, uh, actually, uh, Tom, can I unmute you really quickly, and you can say hi? Uh, so on on here joining us is Tom from Makerversity in London, who uh, is uh, excitingly moving to Portland, um, and I'm going to see if I can unmute him here. Uh, Tom, I'd like to introduce you to Mike Aubrey from Autodesk and Princess Aaliyah. And Princess Aaliyah and Mike, I'd like to introduce you to Tom if you haven't already met him, Mike. And Tom is the person who also is talking to people in Cape Town, South Africa, about starting a makerspace. 
Uh, and Tom, do you have anything to say about like things that you've learned, or you know, the difference in the make diversity model, or anything else you'd like to share with folks on the uh, meeting? Yeah, we've been um, working on our trade trademark and our science security. It's kind of hard to hear you, Tom. Can anybody hear Tom? Anybody? No? All right. That's Tom, everybody. Uh, <laughs> pop us a note, Tom, if you uh, if we can get you on the line. Um, so um, there's a question here. Well, hey, Kavi, that makes it a little easier. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, ADX, how is ADX Finance? Such a great question. Um, I was actually thinking that might come up. Um, so basically, I um, leverage everything that I own in my life <laughs> to mm -hmm. start the space, um, and I, I basically did it through a loan, a personal loan to myself. So I am 100% invested in the space, um, and uh, we are in the process of uh, getting more funding in through our partners. Um, really around this workforce training issue. So we've realized that um, in our community, uh, the big need is that manufacturers uh, can't find a, ta you know, a talent base, a skilled work workforce to uh, keep our manufacturing sector thriving here. And so we are um, developing a curriculum around workforce training that's really project-based learning, collaborative learning, and so, uh, you know, the, the partners that we're bringing around the table are um, going to start providing resources really into a scholarship fund that would then allow uh, us to help bring students into the space. Um, for those of you not familiar with the American education system, it is ethically failing and funding is a huge issue. The way we teach kids, um, how we um, are engaging youth in um, you know, in the process of learning, it's it's just really it's not engaging, and it's really abstract, and it's hard for them to understand. You know, why they're learning fractions, for example. But you hand them a tape measure, and all of a sudden becomes really apparent why you might want to learn fractions. So, um, so that's really exciting for us. But you know, like any business, because we are set up as a business, as an LLC. Um, you know, we I I use the resources. Uh, that I had to get started. That being said, I, you know, I obviously, I, although I might look like a very rich, wealthy woman, I am not. <laughs> so, um, so I really bootstrapped it. And you know, one of the things that I've felt like ADX has done differently than other spaces around the country is really, um, you know, uh, kind of keep the costs realistic. Um, and we didn't try to dump millions of dollars into making this space. Um, we've allowed it to evolve over time. Uh, we've kept the business model very adaptable, and that's easy to do um, with our LLC structure. So, not sure what the equivalent is of that in your community, but um, it's definitely um, uh, something that's allowed us to make decisions quickly. I don't have to go, go to a board of advisors. Um, if somebody comes to me with an idea and it sounds like it's a, uh, something we want to do, then we try it. So there's like, these little experiments that we do and that we test. Um, and when I brought Mike on last year, he actually is formalizing kind of all the process around this and all the systems around it. So it's also very critical um, to kind of document what's really working and what's not so that you can kind of move on and, and keep growing. And I think, uh, if I could piggyback on that too, I've got pulled up on the screen kind of a, one of my favorite things here uh, again is the, on the screen here is ADX2 uh, which was actually designed by a student here who came to learn about manufacturing an architecture student um, and uh, fabrication and ended up as uh, her senior thesis for her master's redesigning ADX and kind of panning through it uh, how we fit into the community. It's got uh, a larger scale, you know, I think it's 40,000 square feet that's designed out. That's actually all stuff we already have to some degree in here. This is just a bigger version of it. Um, and I just kind of want to show that from Kelly's initial bootstrap vision of 
this place where she was just dropping her uh, her personal money in um, and uh, kind of figuring this all out. We're we're in discussions about really taking this here to the next level now that we've taken a long hard look at what does and does not work for us in our community. Um, and I'm going to pull up on contrast here is our existing floor plan which is much smaller as you can see it's about 12,000 square feet and that's wood shop metal shop this green area is kind of our loading bay and event space um, and you can see that the wood shop in the upper left and the metal shop is over here on the right and the bridge uh, our electronics lab is down here in this box but the vast majority of our space is actually either rented out to small businesses who want to also work out of our community uh, and share tools or flex space uh, for all different things to happen because we found a big need for flexible space in our um, uh, 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 our work in that uh, so much goes on here that the space needs to be itself adaptive to whether people are building a big series of tables or we've got uh, the next night uh, that all gets cleared out and we've got a uh, robotics group meeting up and 30 people will be on the factory floor showing off their projects and teaching each other. Um, so um, uh, I think that that's important to keep in mind because that may not work as the right model everywhere. I know we're talking to Lee a lot about what does a makerspace look like in uh, the, when we start one up for the challenge, right? What needs does that need to serve in the community? What um, what issues is it trying to address? Because it's like anything. So whether you're forming it as a for-profit, a non-profit, a community group, whatever structure, it still needs to have a market that it's addressing and a need that it's addressing, or it won't be utilized and it won't attract a community and it won't be sustained. Because I think the takeaway that I've gotten from this is that it's not easy to start one of these, but the hardest part is that after your initial opening and the big excitement is the sustaining it. Um, because it's like any kind of relationship, it's just with a lot of people, it's like whatever it looks like needs to have some sort of driving force behind it um, and some sort of plan behind uh, keeping it going. And that's always been the really hard part for us is that like, you know, uh, on the day to day of just like how does this place function, what needs is it serving, how do we keep our membership rate up, how do I keep our classes filled, and how do we keep it also being fun and awesome all at the same time. And that's the and I think that's the challenge that I think those of you who joined us right at the beginning were hearing is that a lot of these places open and a lot of them disappear after a year or two uh, because people uh, hadn't quite addressed the need in the community or the demand wasn't great enough, um, or they hadn't quite just figured out the right way to structure it. Um, and that's the thing that uh, is, I think, really important to keep in mind, because this is something fun, exciting, undefined, and adaptable that can be very well adapted to meet a lot of needs in a way that many things in the world don't, in terms of sharing and collaboration. Uh, but like anything else, that um, unless you're putting the work in to maintain the machine itself, it's going to fall apart. Uh, and that's the thing that we've discovered has been really difficult in, in, in a model where there is no instruction manual for maintaining the machine. Yeah, and as there's some questions coming up um, around uh, just the way that, that uh, we're teaching kids and engaging people and how to get people to understand. So one of the big things that we've realized is that inviting everyone from your community. So one of the things that really helped us is I've lived in Portland for over 20 years. Um, I know a lot of people in different sectors, so in government, in uh, business, um, in uh, kind of nonprofit, uh, the nonprofit world. And so inviting all of those people that you know to come and experience the space, you may not know exactly what your partnership looks like, but you show them around, you show them. Um, we even did this before we opened. So we had a, our 10,000 square foot warehouse was completely empty except for maybe a couple tools and we just put signs up around that said this is what's going to be in the wood shop and this is what's going to be in the metal shop and here's the list of tools and here's how we're going to use this space and we just got um, students and designers and government officials and everyone into the space looking at it and responding to it and saying what's missing what do you like? What feels weird? What kind of programming would you want to see here? Um, what classes do you want to take? 
Um, why would you be a member? And really trying to that that kind of again that idea of asset mapping, um, getting that that uh, feedback from people, um, and then. Now that we're open, I mean, we've probably had 75,000 people from around the world come through our space since we've opened. And that is really exciting um, for us. And, um, and it really helps us see what people are interested in, what questions they have. Um, and then here locally, you know, really engaging the decision makers um, in you know, in the space and, uh, you know, kind of the folks working on economic development and education. Um, and it's really that kind of collaborative model. Um, and uh, really, you know, we are a business, but, we're, you know, we're not in that, like, competitive mode. You know, we really want to engage as many people as possible with the space, help grow the movement. And, uh, and be a part of that. So I guess, Gert, I would just recommend, you know, it's just patience and keep engaging with people and showing them this design challenge gives us a good way to show people what we mean by combining technology and fabrication um, that a lot of people don't understand what that looks like. So it's giving people examples, showing people, you know, the words that you're using um, don't always you know, translate in somebody else's mind. And, you know, again, makerspace is one of those words. Um, nobody, everyone wants to do it, but nobody knows what it is. So, um, which is great. Um, and that's why we're here. So, if you have other questions about, you know, what, what it is that we, you know, if you have specific questions about the space, um, there might be some questions out there about liability. I don't know if that only comes up in the U.S. Or... Yeah, let's, let's just stay away from that one. That's going to have to be something that just anybody looking to start something needs to know that the liability and insurance are a huge part of these. Well, and I would just say uh, kind of from the softer side, not the legal side. Um, mm -hmm. So we have shop oversight. The entire facility, there's always somebody mm -hmm. on staff who is on site. We have a team of people that we've trained. Who um, who know how to uh, use the tools and uh, can tell if somebody's using the tools uh, unsafely? Everyone who joins the space has to go through a safety orientation. Um, so it's an hour-long safety orientation. It just orients you to the different tools. If you don't know how to use the tools, then we offer classes, um, and then they pay for those classes to learn how to use the tools. So um, it's just one of those things around, um, you know, having enough people around and engaged in the space, and and once you start building that culture of safety and um, and kind of caring for one another, uh, then your liability uh, concerns start to go way down. Yeah. See, um, so our URL is in there. Yeah. What other? I wrote down some so, other things. So one one thing that's kind of uh, I think just another example of um, so we, we initially sort of conceptualized this uh, this this go to meeting as a how to start a maker space um, and one thing that we've always wanted to talk about and I think a lot of interest in is is how do you get people to work together. Um, we, uh, that, I mean, like, I, I, uh, to repeat what somebody said at the beginning of the call, the people are the most important part of the space. The tools are secondary. Um, and uh, I, I think one of the cool things about this, that I, and, and that Autodesk gets, which is why they're on this call with us and in our space as a, as a giant, you know, premier software company in our little space, and I think the thing that, that Princess Ali gets is that there's something very different about this model and whatever iteration it takes is that like through the act of doing something very uh, very traditional and natural which is sharing um, and that's tools, space, knowledge, um, people get together and when you trust them and enable each other we do incredible things. I mean not to like uh, plug the home team, but we've got a UAV team in ADX, for example, um, and these are people with incredibly diverse skill sets from diverse backgrounds. We've got um, people with uh, virtually no aerospace or electrical engineering design participating at an equal level with everybody else in the team um, uh, in designing and building something that virtually no one on the team had built before. 
uh, which are unmanned drones with like optical recognition software that are automated and smart things that can fly themselves. I mean, uh, you know, people just came together and through just knowing people in the community with this stuff, we were able to introduce people and work together to build multiple teams over time and like sort of an in-house initial challenge and then this team, this sort of final combined team of about a dozen that's launched out of there since then and they're doing things that are incredible with technologies that they've never worked with before, most of them on the team, um, and learning from each other and doing it. And you know, I know there's teams all over the world that are doing amazing things. Um, uh, and it it's awesome to see how our community was able to kind of band together and use the resources in the building and the, one of our best resources, which is knowing all the people outside the building and where other tools and knowledge exist and kind of bring it together in, in one space. Um, so, uh, Mike Aubrey, I don't know if you have anything you want to say or anything to add to that in terms of, uh, I'm unmuting you, uh, just your experience here yeah. as a, a partner of ADX um, and how you've seen this come together as a, both as a team member and as an initial facilitator. Uh, of, sure. Of the partner itself. I'll address that in two parts. Um, as, as a business partner, ADX has been indispensable for helping us get our word out and wanting to be indispensable in the design community. It's been an amazingly symbiotic relationship. I mean, we've been able to partner with ADX and provide resources, design software, and in turn they've provided us, I guess mostly, legitimacy in our commitment to the design world. And then also on a secondary thing, um, stories from this stuff. So our ability to be successful has been in this realm is as very much uh, continued with our ability to support uh, the local makerspace here in our area. We say as a as a participant, ADX has been indispensable in our success by providing the ability to come together as a group. I mean, the actual physical space that means something. Uh, they've also been indispensable in providing the the know-how to allow us to basically do better than who we are. Um, by providing both the resources, the wood shop, I mean, access to the computers, but then also to Seamus in the shop. I mean, uh, Brad, who's on my team, he's also part of ADX. I mean, that's been something we would have never been able to accomplish what we could had we not had this central space. Uh, so I would say to anybody involved in this challenge, an open source challenge, which is trying to solve world problems, if we expect as a global community to do well with these types of other challenges that are affecting the world, uh, to not go forward and invest in maker spaces like this in all these communities is really a very short-sighted um, venture. I, I view ADX as being a heavy part of both success and I am very glad to be partnered with them. Can I actually add something? I hope something? you heard Sorry. half that. Can I add something to that? <laughs> can you hear me? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Could you guys hear anything I said? I yeah, know. it was amazing. Thank I was you. writing down both taking notes vigorously. It's going into our marketing materials. Right? Uh, oh, well, <laughs> no, but but Mike, uh, Mike has really been one of the key players, I think, in bringing this relationship together from Portland and WCUAVC. It's it's interesting. Um, I think it was like the first week of January. Somehow. I stumbled across a video that Mike and ADX and Autodesk <laughs> had put together for a mini challenge that occurred at ADX in December, which I had no idea about. But I was so impressed that these guys were really clever to take these two different teams and have a mini challenge at their facility for a week, I think, maybe two weeks, and video it. Uh, they have a nice video outlaying how they did stuff, and I think that would be great to share with our teams to see how that really um, impressed me. And then I reached out to Mike, and I'm like, wow, I don't see a team in the challenge, but I see that you guys did have um, this mini challenge in, in Portland, and I would really be um, thrilled and honored to speak to you and see if we can work together. So it was really exciting for me to see that you guys, on your own, on your own, completely on your own, became creative and took the initiative to put together this challenge. I mean, it was great marketing, I think, for us at WCUAVC as well, because I think there were a lot of other people that probably saw your video and your announcements that went out and how you're creating this little mini challenge in, in Portland, but your overall goal is to solve a much bigger international problem of poaching in South Africa. So to me, I was so impressed and so thrilled with that. And I do want to say thank you to Mike Aubrey and Mike Alfani and Kelly and all of the teams that participated in that particular challenge as well. So thank you so much for putting that together. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, hey, Mike, can you, uh, sorry, I muted you again, Mike, we're getting feedback and static uh, reports again. Um, and, and thank you, Parents Azalea, uh, again, for the shout out and the opportunity to do this. Um, uh, Mike, can you post in, uh, the link to the video the Prince was talking about about our initial challenge that you made? Thank you. Um, and we got a question from Dan Smith on elaborating about how many people are participating in ABX. Um, and I'll answer that, and then otherwise, do you want to just open it up to questions and see what people have left? Yeah, I think, I don't, I can't tell what time it is, but um, yeah, uh, get your questions to us for sure, and yeah, why don't you go ahead and elaborate, and then we can do some wrapping up. So the, how many, the question was, how many folks are participating at ADX? And there's some numbers that are easy to talk about, and some numbers that are more important that uh, I can't actually put a number to. So the easy answer is we have about, 30 to 35 people from graphic designers renting desks to web designers uh, and people who write for a living to people who rent 10 by 10 foot or 10 by 20 foot floor spaces to run their bicycle building startup or a boat building school. Uh, there's about 30 to 35 people renting some sort of space at ADX at any given time. Um, and we do a lot of business incubation here to some degree semi-formally, but, but just like by giving people access to you know half a million dollars worth of tools and a huge community of smart people who know how to get them business insurance or a website built or whatever skills they don't have um, uh, are doing it here. In addition, we generally fluctuate a lot seasonally, um, although it's starting to smooth out as we learn how to do this better. But I would say we lowball 120 and high-end 180 members at any given time who uh, have access to the shop. Um, so uh, beyond that though is the really interesting part to me is the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who have been members who often come back once or twice a year to become members again as they have projects, hundreds of people taking classes every year, uh, and um, uh, all of our community partners. So we partner with local groups such as the Woodworking Supply Store or there's a group of people here who like building tiny houses who we're partnered with who, who come here and do their meetups and run trainings. Um, the Southeast Community Uplift is a neighborhood group that uh, works together to design out and build cool stuff like community gardens in their neighborhoods and we're partnered with them. Um, so our space is very important and the people in with, within it are very important. Uh, but the, the, the community impact and our interactions with community at large are, um, you know, immeasurable. And that's how we really try and amplify what we do and what people do here, more importantly. Um, so measuring the level of participation is really difficult because I can quantify the people that are paying a monthly membership or renting space. I can sort of quantify the number of people that we've ever had into the space. The amount of people who we are who are participating uh, or taking skills back from here and bringing them back to their community group or their shop or whatever, I mean, it's a ton. So, um, Dan, does that answer your question a little bit better, I hope? Uh, yeah, I call the, the people that Mike uh, identified um, the, the numbers um, they're kind of the core, the, you know, like the heart of the community. They're here on a very regular basis. And then there's so many people that come and go. Um, so that's the, you know, the thing that we're doing is kind of slowly building that core. And it's really important that those people be the right people. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, people who, you know, will respect the space, take care of the space, take care of the tools, take care of each other. Um, and there's definitely a weeding out process that some people go through because some people, I think, realize that, that they don't really like to work together. They'd rather just go work by themselves somewhere, and that's totally fine. But uh, what we're really looking for is people who get inspired by other people and who want to learn from other people and um, engage with other people in kind of a positive, um, productive way. This is also by on the screen right now is one of my favorite projects is we uh, there's a local Dark. gaming store who uh, we uh, for those of you who are Star Wars fans we encased him in carbonite in a life cast and put a bunch of blinking Arduino powered LED lights in it and um, this is us showing it off at a maker fair at the local uh, science and industry museum um, so a lot of different things happen here. yeah I have to say like the it's kind of taken on a life of its own. You know, it's really interesting what happens after a few years of doing this. Is 
you know, people start working on their own projects, and we, you know, this kind of stuff starts happening. The the drone challenge, I would have never predicted that we would be engaged with, you know, a worldwide challenge, and that's incredible. Um, this is a project that a couple of our members made. It's a little teardrop trailer. So they're they're avid travelers, and they wanted something to hook up their, to their little Mini Cooper. So they had no idea what they were doing. They've never done it before, and and that's the thing that I just get so impressed by is people just jumping in and trying it, and and not being afraid to just do it and kind of learn along the way. Um, so yeah, this is the carbonite, some of the carbonite um, process. Uh, so that's the other thing that's really exciting uh, for me is to really engage people in the process of how things are made. You get so much more respect for objects and and things that are made. We've become such a you know mass production, make a bunch of stuff you know, somewhere else out of sight and then it ends up in our landfills. And so bringing some consciousness to the process of how things are made, um, I hope gives people a bigger appreciation for that and then therefore um, helps them understand why handcrafted items made by people might be more expensive than the stuff you can get at IKEA or one of the other um, large stores. So. Um, and and that people can learn how to do it themselves. So if you see a bookshelf that you like, you know, you can come here and learn how to make it, and you'll probably keep it forever because you you did it. So that's another um, interesting angle. Just on, I mean, that is a huge problem for us globally. The amount of waste that we produce uh, through you know through our consumption. So um, we definitely. Uh, see people getting a little bit more enlightened by, wow, I didn't realize how, how complicated this was and how long it was going to take um, to actually make stuff. Um, and these are great photos. And, oh, thanks. Thanks, Tiffany. <laughs> That's the other thing. We have talented photographers coming in and out of the space all the time. So it's, it's been a challenge for us to document this, and we're so glad that we, we do have the photos that we have, but it represents probably one one thousandth of what's happened here since we've opened. So that documentation of what you're doing it, uh, is really important. So I would think about that as people start to look at uh, building their spaces is try to have that uh, AV team on, on hand to, uh, to document the things that are happening in your space so that you can then share them in this format with others around the world. So, um... Aaliyah, is there anything else you'd like us yeah, to cover, uh, or actually, uh, do folks yeah, have questions they want to pop in the queue? Well, I think it would be great if we had our South African director um, come online and talk about it from his perspective in Amakala and how beneficial this will be for the actual final competition, because I think he'll be much better at explaining that this is a remote, private game reserve that we're going to be at, and having this facility is just going to take the challenge to another level for the teams because we know that the teams are going to be working really hard to bring this technology all the way to South Africa. And we, we would love to make sure that they're able to still compete in the challenge and we don't want any minor abilities in their travel of the actual UAV products to cause any issues. And that's why the maker space at the final competition will be very important. But I'll be here again. Gert, can you make Gert live? Is that a really Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Good. Hi. Good, yeah. Listen, it's very important for us over here, and I guess for everyone else to understand, uh, once we get into uh, the Bushveld, as we call it, uh, we need these uh, entrants to be able to participate, which is why I've been pushing so hard to, uh, to help get a, a temporary maker space up and part of it is there's so many there's so many smart people participating uh, in this competition and helping out we're hoping that we can leverage uh, you know the knowledge of those those people who are helping out so that we leave a little bit of uh, innovation and uh, forward thinking behind uh, to the people here in South Africa so that's really uh, the big impact that we're hoping for uh, what we learned from the the first uh, challenge will be great, but the impact uh, down the road of uh, where we go and the innovative thinking is is so much greater, and that's what we're excited about.
Thanks, LB. I think it was important. I actually just turned off my webcam. That's it. Uh, I myself. So, uh, uh, you know. Sorry. Are you there? Yeah. Do we, do we... She just turned off her webcam. Oh, okay. Sweet. Um, yeah, and I think I think one thing to keep in mind is, you know, I was looking at some initial uh, uh, initial mock-ups of the, the space that you're looking at, and um, uh, my uh, my gut reaction was that uh, I think the initial drawings you had of it, Scott, were uh, that I've seen on your website were were cool. They were great use of small space. Um, did notice a lack of functionality for cutting uh, for non-metal stuff, so things like a, a shop. Side, uh, or a like uh, work side uh, work site size table saw or hot foam cutters would be really handy to have on hand in any kind of space that's going to be flexible um, and maybe something larger and more sustainable than a work site table saw especially if it's going to remain in the community because I think especially in a space like that you want to not only utilize space well but keep the machines to be the most flexible easily maintained ones that you possibly can and so basic uh, but highly adaptable tools like table saws that can cut wood, that can cut foam, that can cut plastic, uh, I think are all uh, are all um, excellent things to consider having in a, in any space that uh, needs to be adaptable and easily maintained. Um, uh, uh, for, especially for something like this, for the initial challenge where people are going to be working with a lot of different diverse materials. Yeah, and I think one of my questions would be um, uh, so because you're kind of in a more rural setting, um, the community of people that live there, are there, are there ways that this kind of space can serve them kind of beyond the, the challenge so that you're building it for the drone, for the challenge, probably for some ongoing um, access to the space for that project specifically, but it would be interesting to know kind of what the other community needs are so that, you know, kind of long term, it's there to engage with the local people. And I don't know how many people are there locally. And um, maybe you can give some background. And we can kind of use you as a case study to talk about, you know, what this looks like. Is he still on? Yeah, definitely. Uh, great question. So the plan would be this. Uh, the game was reserve that uh, the private reserve where we're headquartered is about 45 minutes from Port Elizabeth. Uh, when we're finished uh, with the challenge and, and everyone's uh, returned home, then we'll move the equipment into Port Elizabeth. Okay. And, and, so, and, that'll, and that'll give us universities in the local area as well as basically an urban environment where uh, we hope to then, you know, build the makerspace from there. But uh, the temporary site will be at Amakala just for accessibility for the team members, and then uh, the equipment will be moved back and will actually stand the permanent makerspace up in, in the town of Port Elizabeth. So i say one thing to be, you know, and, and I think Kelly and I both have a, a fairly uh, – Robust background in environmental planning and uh, and, and like a social use of space beyond even our in prior lives of make space is the one thing I think that you really want to consider in this too. Um, and I'm sure you guys have, but is not just the equipment and where it goes after the challenge because uh, turns out as I'm sure you know, plunking a bunch of tools in a room is not going to do a whole lot. Um, Really interfacing, ensuring that if you if it's not going to be maintained by you directly over the time that the there is a plan of people who are responsible leaders in a community who are able to bring people together around that sort of stuff to keep and maintain a collaborative space uh, is just important as any kind of tooling that can be left behind because it it turns out that it's not again you know the tools aren't that hard to get and the the number that you need they don't need to be the highest, bestest, uh, newest thing. I mean, we don't have very modern machines here, and it's fine. Um, but uh, the, what we do have is people who maintain them, um, people who maintain each other and keep each other safe and ensure that things aren't breaking and we're doing preventative maintenance and that there's a plan of action for the next you know, year in terms of the, like replacements or things that we know we're going to need. Uh, and then we're checking on these things. And when they do break, we want to make sure we have manuals for everything to know, make sure we know how to fix them. Um, yeah, and that would be, I mean, one of my questions would be, you know, what are kind of the big issues that Port Elizabeth is facing as a community? Um, is there a certain, certain um, you know, job sectors or environmental issues? Um, you know, kind of what, 
you know, and this is again why it wouldn't make any sense for me to start a makerspace in Port Elizabeth. So you ha like giving us a little um, 101 on what the issues are in Port Elizabeth. Is that something that? Yeah, and uh, your points are well noted. In fact, uh, one of our one of our people who will be heading up the makerspace is is online here. Garrett's online, or he was earlier. I saw him. Uh, Want to say hello to everyone. So the idea is we're trying to get the uh, community involved, and then what we'll hope to do is some workshops while the UAV Challenge folks are out, so we can kind of, you know, invigorate even more. Uh, that, uh, very, very duly noted that it's the people that are important. Uh, and, and I could talk all day about the challenges we have here in Port Elizabeth, but I think it's probably for a better setting. Uh, I certainly will take all your inputs, though, and, uh, and get you some answers on that stuff over the upcoming days. Yeah, because I think just to summarize, you know, some of the things that we did in the beginning was that asset mapping. What's already out there? How are people already working together? Uh, we have a, co a lot of cooperative wood shops, a lot of cooperative metal shops. People join forces who are building motorcycles, bicycles. But they're, they're kind of um, siloed into those groups of architects forming a collective, groups of photographers. So really what we determined was our niche was uh, bringing all of those together in one space. What happens when you bring those different disciplines together? Um, there was already a photography studio that was teaching classes and had equipment, so we didn't include that in our programming, and we partnered with them instead ceramics, glass. So we're not trying to be like the Costco of our community. We're trying to be, uh, you know, really heavily networked and fill a niche. And the niche that we're serving is bringing people together, teaching them how to work together, teaching them how to use these tools. And many of our um, members have graduated and gone into their own spaces, started their own collectives, started their own fab houses. Uh, their businesses have grown out of the space because they've been so successful. So, um, so anyway, that asset mapping, identifying the challenges in your community and the things that you'd really like this space to be part of solving um, those, those problems, and then engaging anyone and everyone you know in that conversation. So I would say those are probably kind of the top three things uh, to do before investing in a building and a bunch of tools and all of that other stuff is really understand the lay of the land um, because this again the size of your space the tooling your programming will all um, will all uh, evolve out of that process so hopefully that helps kind of summarize some things any other questions out there um, if you have questions, throw them in the questions pane, uh, or raise your hand, or any of the other weird things. So the thing is, I'm so used to working with people in person now. I'm having trouble interfacing <laughs> with technology. I think I think Princess Alia noticed this with my uh, my lackluster email response time. <laughs> so running around a shop uh, trying to work with people all day, and then I get to my inbox and I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> I owe responses to five thousand people. Yeah, that's okay. But I'm still thrilled to be partnered with ADX. Uh, you guys are doing a great, fantastic job. And I think together we'll really be able to set up um, some makerspaces around the world. And actually, um, we're going to be going into a Skype call in a small remote village in Kenya within the next couple of weeks. And part of that is how do you take technology and incorporate it into communities as well? So a lot of these people have no idea at all about types of technology. I'm sorry, I think there's static that I hear. Okay, they're better. Um, but, you know, part, part of that whole initiative with our um, friend in Kenya is to allow these people in these rural areas to understand that, you know what, you can have a community like ADX. It doesn't have to be completely tech savvy or focus, but it could be a community where you can focus on beadwork that allows them to be able to sell their products into the market. It could be clay, you know, making these little potteries, even if it's for their own homes and stuff. How do you solve the problem of if you're living in the wilderness and living with these wild animals, how do you make a good fence? So one of the things we're looking at is setting up a community makerspace for them 
where maybe seven or eight different villages can come in and learn from each other and work with each other in this space that now provides a place for all of them to share their knowledge and information and solve problems that perhaps one village has already done, but another has not. And then looking at technology as, hey, you know, this can really make a difference for us. They might not be creating drones, but maybe we could use the drones that are used for wildlife protection to actually help them deliver their products to the city where we can actually have a location where somebody gets that package and is able to ship it off to somewhere else in the world. And now these products are being sold all over the world, all because it started from a tiny little makerspace somewhere in a rural village of Kenya. I mean, that's just an example, but I think it's so powerful and it's so empowering for the people that are actually living these communities to understand that, hey, you know what? We can actually um, create stuff for ourselves. We can solve our own problems. And that gives them the respect and the dignity that they also want to feel instead of just aid um, that a lot of big organizations or countries provide in these poor areas. They, they want to be able to live and solve their own problems as well. And it's interesting. I saw this documentary about this guy at MIT, and he found out about some kids in Sierra Leone who was picking up little um, electrical pieces and putting them together and making stuff and a radio and all these things. And he sponsored this kid to come to MIT. And one of the things that he said, which made me or left an impression for me was, look, you know, I wish that countries or organizations wouldn't just give us aid. They would actually help us be able to solve our own problems. And, and for me, that was so inspiring once again, it's because I already had this vision of being able to do this around the world, but now we also hear from somebody else that's doing the same thing and from Sierra Leone, getting his PhD at MIT. I mean, that's impressive. I'm actually going to get in touch with him soon and hopefully bring him on board so maybe we could start something in Sierra Leone for them as well. So it's all about networking, like Kelly said, and knowing the right people and then bringing them in together. Sometimes you want to have partners, sometimes you want to have sponsors, and you have to have your members. But all of these organizations have to come together to complete the entire circle and be able to work together. And that's, you know, I love the fact that that's your, your um, slogan, working together. Yes, it is difficult for some people to work together and others want to just work alone. And I think when you are around people that you can trust and people that are really there to help you grow and learn, um, I think it changes the perspective of working together as well. So I think... I'm hoping through our webinars with our teams all over the world and us doing these different webinars and different topics will help them understand it doesn't matter where you are in the world, we can work together. We can solve an international crisis that is occurring right now, whereas these large organizations that have tons and tons of money aren't capable of solving these problems. So, you know, I'm very thankful and grateful to my partners, to our teams and the members that are in those teams and the sponsors that are sponsoring those teams and the sponsors that are sponsoring the Wildlife Conservation UAV Challenge. So, you know, I'm, I'm really honored to be working with all these individuals from around the world with visions and all these genius minds that are eager to solve and do something really great around the world. So thank you so much, everybody for being part of the Wildlife Conservation UAV Challenge. Yeah, Thanks thank for, you. Thanks uh, for doing what you're doing yeah. and everybody on the call for their participation in, in this stuff. This is, a, uh, you know, I think that uh, Kelly and I are the last people on earth you'd actually want making anything, uh, <laughs> but we love enabling other people to be able to do it. So. Uh, that's halfway true, but I really, yeah, I'm really honored to be part um, of, of all of this. Our partnership with Autodesk is, is really inspiring, and we're hoping to bring other um, companies in to, to that um, partnership model and uh, to continue to engage with the, the issues that you care, care about, Princess Aaliyah, and you're really uh, tuned in to kind of the bigger issues going on in the world. and. That's helpful to give us some perspective on, on the, the, the challenges that are out there. And I think one of the things that I really enjoyed um, hearing you say was just this message to kind of disenfranchised people um, and youth especially. This is the message that we're um, really gearing up to help young people understand is they can take control of their economic destiny. 
you know, we can, with the right resources and the right partnerships, uh, we can expose these people to opportunities that they otherwise uh, would not be exposed to. And um, it is going to take this this network of of people and partners uh, to help uh, kind of get get the world going in a better direction. <laughs> so. Uh, we're super excited to be part of this. We look forward to future webinars. If people who are listening have more questions, want to hear about it from a different angle, want more, want to invite more people to participate, let us know, and we can continue to develop uh, more uh, more uh, webinars that are targeted to specific topics. So definitely feedback uh, is always helpful so that we know if we're helping <laughs> answer questions that people have out there. So I just pop my email out there, but if you guys, anybody needs anything from me or has further follow-up or questions, uh, we'd also love feedback on this. Um, as you can see, Kelly and I are sitting in front of a whiteboard. I think we're not using it because we're not sure everyone would be able to see it on the go to meeting. So we're uh, we're not much of the web presenters yet. No I don't PowerPoint. Think. But um, <laughs> that's because we prefer talking to people face-to-face -face a lot of the time. Uh, and. Uh, we're much better in front of a whiteboard. So if you guys can help us do that, or comments on how to do that digitally, virtual whiteboards. Yeah, that's sure uh, that's how we that's how we well, that's kind of how we work together around here. So uh, thanks everybody for the time. Get in touch if you have next steps. And uh, do you, uh, Mike or Aaliyah, do you guys have anything else to add, or is that a wrap? Um, I think we're good. You guys did a fantastic job. I think this is great, and we'll get into more Pacifics next time around. Okay, great. Great. Yep. Well, thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> and uh, thus ends the webinar. Thanks, everyone. Bye, folks. Bye. The organizer has ended.